welcome to the fifth edition of satyam yoga conclave yoga and education uh, so we will uh, we will take the proceedings after shanti part so i request swami ji to take us through the shanti part and after that we will have this session with ashwini namo narayan namo narayan please sit in a comfortable meditative posture and your knees in nyan or chin mudra head neck shoulders back or in a straight line eyes and mouth gently closed become aware of the whole body from the top of your head to your toes awareness of your head neck shoulders back hips legs the shift your awareness to your breath normal spontaneous breathing coupled with awareness i am breathing in and i am breathing out and i am aware i am breathing in i am aware i am breathing out let this be the form of your awareness for some time shift your awareness to your eyebrow center bhru madhya visual form of either your guru or your ishta devata or a brightly burning candle flame and maintaining your awareness on this we shall chant the mantra om three times together followed by the shanti mantras take a deep breath in ओम सहना सह नौ भुन सह वीर वह तेजस्वीनावधीतमस्त मेदिषा वह ओ शाति 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 हरि ओ gently rub your palms against each other place them on the closed eyes experience the warmth radiating from your palms to your eyes energizing the eyes the brain the whole body then gently move the palms away open your eyes hari om tat sat namo narayan jai ho over to you chitra bhano namo narayan swami ji namo narayan everyone thank you for joining us on this second session of the fifth edition of satyam yoga conclave uh, and uh, as we all know this month is theme is yoga and education so this conclave is all about yoga and education and we have a very bright student with us to talk to us today ashwini orpe Uh, i don't know if i can say dr ashwini or uh, dr in making ashwini so, you know uh, in uh, medical uh, fraternity we have a convention that uh, the moment they go into final mbbs we start calling them doctor so she is dr ashwini yes 
Okay, very glad. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us, uh, Dr. Ashwini, today. Um, so she is a student, very bright and intelligent uh, medical student who is taking her final year MBBS in, uh, uh, I didn't get the college name, Ashwini. Uh, when you talk, maybe you can fill it up. Uh, so yes. there is a dash as of now. Uh, and uh, she will talk to us about uh, yoga and education, the perspective of student. So what are the difficulties a student can face and uh, how she overcame some of the problems that she got. And she may probably talk to us about her uh, friend's problems also. Uh, so after she talks, we will listen to her first and uh, whatever questions we have, uh, we can put them on the chat window so that everybody can see. And uh, if there are any associated questions, they can also add to those. Uh, I request all others to uh, stay on their videos on if possible and then uh, as much as possible don't interrupt the speaker and uh, put the questions in the chat window unless it is really very urgent uh, correction or addition that they want to do and after that uh, you know after she speaks uh, we will address the questions in the chat window and then we will take the uh, opinion of Swamiji and how uh, yoga can help those problems and, uh, you know, add on to whatever uh, Ashwini has done. Yeah, over to you, Ashwini. Thank you so much for joining us. And yeah, please take it. Uh, firstly, I want to thank uh, Swamiji for giving me this opportunity and Satyam Sumiran Yoga Foundation. Uh, everyone, my name is Ashwini Olte. I am a final year medical student at DKL Valavalkar Medical College in Chiplun. Uh, I will start talking about the topic now. Uh, when I was asked to speak about this topic, uh, the problems that students face uh, in education and in their daily life, so many thoughts immediately started coming in my head. Uh, you know, as students were very used to complaining about uh, minor inconveniences and everything that we face in our day-to-day -day lives. But as I was thinking, I realized that we don't really take any action or steps to reduce or tackle these problems or reduce the stress that these problems cause us. So when I was thinking, I started writing down uh, some of the problems that I face or uh, that I see that my friends are facing and in general, uh, people around us, students that face. And uh, I'm going to share these with you all. And I'll be elaborating on a few of them because of uh, because I'll be able to tell them in a better way. Okay. Uh, so the problems that students face, that I think that students face, uh, they are increasing amount of competition in today's world. Then there is peer pressure. Uh, there is also parental pressure uh, that uh, students face. Uh, sometimes the stress that comes with merely coping with the vast amount of syllabus and curriculum that the students have to cover. Uh, then maintaining a balance between their academics and their social life. And uh, in today's world, there are so many distractions that it is difficult to stay focused and uh, you know disciplined and uh, really have uh, some kind of motivation while studying. And uh, something that I don't know if everyone faces, but something that I personally face uh, is moving away from home uh, to a hostel and uh, being homesick as well as dealing with all the added responsibilities that come when you're staying alone. So uh, now I'll start talking about uh, each of the problems that I want to discuss in detail. Uh, firstly, I want to talk about a very big problem that students today face and that is increasing amount of competition. So I'm sure you all are uh, parents and if you have kids that are giving their board exams or they're preparing for any kind of entrance exams or competitive exams, then you all must definitely uh, be knowing about the kind of competition that is there out there in the world. It is uh, really crazy and a very different level of competition. So um, in school, when I was in school, I gave a lot of competitive exams like uh, scholarship or Pumibaka, Pravinya Pravinya exams, ITM, etc. And while I'm glad that I gave these exams, and these exams helped me gain a lot of uh, knowledge and understanding, better understanding of the subject. Uh, and they definitely prepared me for what I was going to face uh, beyond school. But um, I cannot say that they didn't add to the stress. They definitely added to the stress and pressure at that time. 
overall uh, right now i'm glad that i gave them it was a very nice experience uh, that not a lot of students give all these competitive exams in their school so i'm definitely glad that i gave them but uh, it did add to a lot of stress uh, when i gave a neat exam to get into medical college uh, just to give you all a basic idea there were around 12 lakh students who were taking uh, who were appearing for the exam uh, that year and all over india only 34000 students got admission and in maharashtra around 2500 students only got admission out of 12 lakh so uh, the competition is really really a lot that the students face and after getting admission i spoke to a few of my uh, mother's friends who are doctors and also uh, other people like like my family doctor and all and uh, while talking to them they were telling me how it, how different it was uh, for them back in their days so they didn't have any kind of uh, competitive exam and they got their admission based on their 12 core results and um, while i'm not saying that it wasn't difficult or challenging for them i'm sure it must have been but it was i would say a lot less stressful uh, to get admission into it now the course of mbbs is still the same and i'm sure uh, it was equally difficult for them as it is for us and probably it must have been even more difficult because uh, we have access to a lot more resources in today's world but uh, i wanted to focus on the entrance exam point of view so um, the students uh, listen uh, in mbbs course a lot of uh, my classmates have parents who are doctors and we also happen to share the exact same opinion and a few of them even advise them not to uh, become a doctor because of the kind of competition that exists in this uh, in this field now i'm not saying that uh, competition exists only in mbbs uh, people kind of glamorize mbbs as some extremely difficult course and while yes it is difficult it is i'm sure this exact amount of competition or probably even more challenges exist in a lot of different fields as well so all fields uh, any post graduate or degree courses are difficult uh, and really challenging for the students um there is also a certain amount of stress that comes with uh, just having to cover such a vast amount of curriculum and portion in school it was very easy we had everything that we needed to know for the exam and in general uh, compactly packed in a small textbook and we were able to study that and we were able to pass but uh, i think in all kind of degree courses uh, we don't have all the information at one place we have to refer to multiple textbooks we have to search to various resources and other uh, uh, materials to really get an understanding about what the subject is and uh, that is also quite difficult and uh, covering all of that in a limited amount of time like five years might seem like a very long time but uh, considering the portion it is not very long so yeah now this also holds true for all other fields um, the next very important uh, challenge or problem that i feel students face is uh, peer pressure now uh, in kids there is this uh, kids and in general students there is this innate desire to want to be a part of the group so uh, they want to fit in and they want to do what all their friends are doing they want to be popular among their friends and that's why uh, they will do a lot of things that they normally wouldn't have done now this can include uh, something which is as simple as playing a prank uh, playing a prank on someone or uh, dressing in a particular manner or something but it can also uh, cause uh, a person to start smoking or consume alcohol uh, i have seen a lot of people in my college and other colleges who never used to drink never smoke cigarettes but they came here they saw other people doing it and that pressure they have started smoking and drinking and uh, peer pressure can also add to a lot of stress uh, among students because uh, in a group there can be one person everybody is different and everybody has different capacities and takes different amount of time to learn a particular uh, subject or not just a subject any kind of a thing everybody has different learning pathways for it so uh, suppose one person uh, needs only two readings to complete or understand a particular subject and uh, another person needs to read the same thing for four times now obviously the first person is able to complete uh, the given syllabus in a smaller amount of time 
and that's why they will have uh, a lot of free time to pursue other activities other hobbies extracurricular activities now the second person is not able to do that because he's barely able to complete uh, the academic portion of it now that person is going to see that his friends are studying they're managing their studies well they're scoring well and at the same time they're also uh, being able to work out and uh, have fun with other people and uh, that person is stuck studying so that is going to cause a lot of negative uh, thoughts about themselves in their minds it is going to cause uh, insecurities and make them feel bad about themselves in general now um, when we talk about peer pressure we mostly focus on the negative aspects of peer pressure but there are also a lot of positive aspects uh, that peer pressure can cause so uh, a positive kind of peer pressure is going to help students uh, do a lot of activities that they normally wouldn't have done but which are really good also so if a person falls in the right company of friends or falls in a good group of friends then they are definitely going to motivate that person to study they are going to motivate that person to uh, give up some of his bad habits they are going to pers uh, persuade the person to uh, take up some new hobbies take up some different interests pursue their uh, interests that they were probably earlier not pursuing so this is going to result in a overall well rounded uh, kind of personality for the student so uh, peer pressure can have a lot of positive effects also uh, the next point that i want to talk about that i feel a lot of students that i see around me face is parental pressure now parents want a bright future for their kids they want their kids to be well settled and happy and that they are absolutely right and justified in wanting that uh, it is what a parent wants definitely but uh, because of that they push you uh, and students to you know uh, perform better in their exams uh, pursue different activities pursue their different hobbies and uh, kind also not just this also they want you to become friends with uh, the people that they think are right and uh, just in general they will encourage the child uh, to do to step out of their comfort zone but sometimes what happens is parents uh, cross the line between encouraging their child and actually being overbearing on them so uh, i am thankful that my parents uh, and i am thankful and grateful that my parents have never forced me to do anything they haven't been overbearing on me and they've always nurtured what i wanted to do and uh, not put a lot of pressure on me for getting good grades and they were just happy with what all everything that i was doing so i'm thankful for that but i see a lot of friends around me who have so much pressure from their parents for performing well that even at the age of 22 and 23 they are scared that if they get uh, a few less marks than what their parents wanted then their parents will be upset with them and uh, this thing and not just uh, performing well in exams that uh, kids nowadays that i see have been going to tuition classes and other extra curricular classes from second third standard itself like uh, i didn't go to any kind of tuition classes right up till 9 10th standard and uh, i'm sure my parents in their generation none of them used to go to tuition classes for 10th standard 8th standard 7th standard but kids are going right from 3rd standard nowadays and not just uh, tuitions but also other uh, activity classes like singing class dance class uh, language classes or sports athletic classes now while i'm not saying that uh, they should not be going to these kind of classes they definitely should if the child has interest in a particular field then the parents it's their job to nurture that uh, interest and make sure that the kid is getting everything all the opportunities that the uh, child deserves uh, if they have an interest in something but what i see uh, very often around me is that the the kid has no interest in that particular field but it's the parent who wants the kid uh, to be able to sing to be able to dance ki nahi mere bacche ko जिमनास्टिक्स आना चाहिए मेरे बच्चे को अच्छे से सिंगिंग आना चाहिए सो दे डोंट कंसिडर द फैक्ट दैट देर किड इज नॉट इंटरेस्टेड इन इट सो दिस इज गोइंग टू लीड टू नेगेटिव फीलिंग्स इन द चाइल्ड एंड दिस थिंग एंड समटाइम्स आई फील दैट इवन इफ पेरेंट्स डोंट पुट डायरेक्ट प्रेशर ऑन द किड 
uh, what happens is there is an innate uh, desire among the kids to want to make their parents proud, to want to be uh, liked by their parents and want their approval. And in general, just making them proud and happy is what I think all most of the kids desire. So even if the parents don't put any kind of direct pressure, there is always an indirect pressure uh, to perform better and perform well. And uh, if they're not able to perform well, then it's going to lead to negative feelings about themselves and the kids. Okay. Uh, the next point is, um, it is difficult to maintain a balance between your academics and studies and uh, maintaining a social life. Now, uh, in today's generation, with the advent of social media, uh, there is more and more importance on having a social life and uh, being able to meet all your friends and, uh, you know, just in general being social. Uh, so if somebody is not on Instagram, they're ridiculed that how are you not, in, uh, not on Instagram or uh, you are a child, you are supposed to be on Instagram, you're supposed to have fun. Uh, so that. Uh, in MBBS, um, I have seen that, I have faced this problem myself that there are so many exams, there are so many assignments that I have to complete that are due, uh, that it becomes difficult to strike that balance between this and studies. Uh, many a times I decide that I'm going to, I make a schedule that uh, today from this to this time, I'm going to do this. And then uh, after that, for two hours, I'm going to go out with my friends or I'm going to exercise. But uh, because always exams are coming up, and something or the else is always there. And even if exams are not there, there is always so many things that we are learning every day that uh, I always end up prioritizing that and just skipping exercise or just not doing, uh, not going out with my friends or uh, you know, in general that. And uh, after coming here in MBBS, uh, there have been so many times that I have not been able to go and attend family functions or uh, uh, some of my school friends are meeting, but I'm not able to go there, uh, go and meet uh, meet them because I have something else that is more urgent at that point of time. So uh, I feel that this kind of leads to an alienating feeling or a um, feeling of not belonging somewhere. So that also leads to, uh, I won't say a stress, but it doesn't make you feel good about yourself uh, when that happens. And uh, yeah, uh, because of social media, uh, what has happened is uh, when you scroll on Instagram, you see that your friends uh, have gone out somewhere or uh, somebody that you know from school or somewhere has gone on a trip to Manali, has gone on some international trip uh, or just that something they are doing something that you think is uh, very cool or very nice and interesting and you are stuck here studying or you are stuck here doing something else at that time. So that leads to a uh, fear of missing out or FOMO as our generation calls it. So um, that also takes a toll on the child's mind. Okay. Uh, the next problem uh, that I think uh, kids face nowadays or in general is uh, a lot of distractions. And uh, that's why it doesn't, it's not easy to stay focused and maintain your uh, discipline. So um, then I, I got, a mobile phone when I was in 10th standard, so after 10th standard, sorry, after I uh, passed out from school. And I see kids nowadays get mobile phones right from third, fourth standard. They're always playing games. There are so many distractions, whole range of distractions that comes uh, with any kind of technology, like a mobile phone or a uh, television for that matter. So there will be a TV serials, there will be some dramas, there will be online storybooks, uh, there will be video games, there will be social media, everything. All of these are very big distractions uh, for the children. So uh, what happens is when you have a phone from such a young age, you get so used to uh, all of those distractions that it's difficult to uh, actually remember that you have to study or uh, what you want actually. Um, what happens is uh, once you start watching a particular television series, uh, it's very difficult to say uh, to say stop and like bus abhi I'm going to stop and I'm going to start studying after this or uh, that's it. it it becomes difficult you can't control yourself so a lot of time what happens is your 15 or 20 minute breaks turns into an hour long break or sometimes even two hour long breaks now when that happens 
this has happened to me a lot personally so i have planned something that i'm going to do all of these things uh, today and uh, i end up uh, taking a two hour break instead of an half an hour break so the additional one and a half hour that i have wasted uh, just doing nothing i have wasted this where is that time going to come from the time that i had planned something else to study or do something else so uh, i'm not able to complete everything that i had planned for that day and when i'm not uh, able to complete that uh, i'm feeling upset that i'm not able to stick to my schedule or uh, complete everything that i wanted and this being upset further makes me not uh, able to focus on my studies and that sort of uh, vicious cycle goes on and trust me when you're watching netflix or when you're playing games uh, time flies like anything so it is uh, you really have to be determined to say ki abhi i'm going to stop and uh, this is all i'm going to do now okay um the next problem as i said that i personally faced it may not be applicable to everyone uh, here uh, but i'm sure it applies to all students who have moved across uh, away from their home and uh, that is the feeling of homesickness moving away from home and just all the added responsibilities that come with it now um, there is a lot when i first moved here to chitwan uh, i was so homesick that i used to want to come back to the home as soon as i came back from home to the college so uh, there was a, there were a lot of emotions lot of crying on the phone ki hey, mama i want you here uh, i want to come back and i'm not saying that still doesn't happen but you sort of get used to it it never gets easier but it is uh, linked to a lot of emotions and everything uh, just not being able to be close to your friends and family uh, is also difficult now um, another thing that i realized after coming here is that at home we take so so many things for granted uh, like uh, when i came uh, here in the college uh, we have to do everything from everything ourselves right from cleaning the toilets uh, to cleaning our rooms to washing my clothes to managing the money that i have been given to spend uh, in that particular month or uh, just getting used to eating mess ka khana and uh, no we are so used to having our mom's hands food that uh, we really miss all of that and uh, it made me realize how easy we have things back at home everything is brought to us in a platter your mom cooks and you just have to go and eat uh, the bai is cleaning everything so everything is just easier and here everything has to be done by us because no one else is going to do it for us so that was a big change and uh, doing all of these chores also it's up into the time that i have for studying so after attending college then i have certain amount of time left only and in that i have to fit in cleaning clothes cleaning the room so it eats up further on the time uh, lastly i want to uh, i feel like this is a problem that not just students i feel a lot of other people also face and that is um, wondering if all of this is worth it so it it doesn't happen very often but sometimes you know the thought does come in my mind that uh, why am i doing all of this ki mbbs kyu karna tha mujhe main kuch aur bhi le sakti thi so uh, at those times i have to keep reminding myself that why i took this in the first place what i want from it what i want for my future uh, what i want to do to serve the community and in general just uh, staying true to what i want and uh, staying true to myself so it's difficult um, usually these kind of thoughts uh, come during the exam season when we are under so much stress that we are like mm, i could have done anything else why did i want to do this only but um, you have to get out of that uh, thinking and just focus on whatever is at hand at that point of time and uh, yeah that that's it yeah that's such a such a wonderful thing uh, ashwini to hear to you i think you spoke for all your student community and many of the parents here also agree with uh, those uh, problems that you are saying you know that our our children also definitely faced all that and uh, yes. yeah i forgot to tell in the introduction uh, when she was talking about the purpose why mbbs and all i remember to mention this that ashwini's uh, choice of mbbs is with a bigger purpose of seva 
so she wants to uh, help people and that's the reason why she took mbbs and uh, uh, i think uh, i'm sure ashwini that that is keeping you going uh, yeah. the idea right yes um, very nice and uh, 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 i wish you all the best and uh, you know the way you summed up everything in such short span shows that uh, you you know you have a lot of talent and you know you you have that flow in you so i am i'm sure you will go places god bless you uh, thank you so much thank I you for few... giving me this opportunity also uh, no you are not done actually we have questions yeah 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 definitely i was just <laughs> yeah um so i have one question here uh, you know why do you think you uh, you know you were in one of those 2500 students out of 20 lakh odd people who took the exam yeah so what are your ideas like what what put you uh, in that uh, short group of people what what are your qualities that made you go there i think uh, throughout right from a very young age i knew that i wanted to be a doctor i knew why i wanted to be a doctor and uh, i think i have never even considered any other career options it was always that i want to be a doctor so i was very focused and intent on that this is my goal this is what i want to do um from school itself i have been giving competitive exams that will help me uh, prepare for for uh, neat which is also a really competitive exam so uh, all mcq based questions and everything uh, all of those exams as i said have definitely helped me uh, be prepared for giving me that i feel a lot of other students uh, who directly give neat for the first time as any competitive exams so i'll be having that advantage over them uh, and uh, not just that uh, i have uh, gone to foundation classes to clear all of my basics uh, that i needed for attempting neat and uh, throughout my 11th and 12th standard uh, i have repeated for one year so i took a, uh, i gave neat but uh, i didn't get the score that i expected i could have gotten into a college but uh, i wanted to do better because i knew i could so uh, i gave neat again the next year so for all those three years uh, i was completely focused uh, i did not it it's little contrary to what i just said that uh, you need to have a balance between studies and social life as well but for those three years uh, i was completely only and only focused on uh, the academic uh, part and uh, uh, a lot of hard work uh, that i put in and uh, not just my hard work my parents hard work they have been Uh, they were so 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 supportive right from enrolling me in the best class possible uh, to making sure that i didn't have to do any of the ghar ka kaam and uh, like giving me all the time and everything that i needed to be able to crack neat so uh, i want to thank them as well and uh, yeah just overall i feel hard work and uh, being focused and other advantages as well great yeah these are really doctor ashwini i have a question for you yes swamiji uh like you rightly mentioned first firstly let me say that it had it has been very humbling to hear what you have said and i am sure it would be same for so many of the other delegates also yes we do not realize uh we have all gone through such uh, difficulties but because we have finished with them they are old memories and our memories uh, of this area always are good memories and the hardships we are for, forget them and yes. so of uh, moments which come up in the uh, stress which a child has to undergo many times parents and adults forget about it and so it is really very humbling to uh, listen to how very beautifully you have summed up the whole thing so congratulations to you on that thank you thank you so much yes uh, uh one small thing that i want to say i feel um, uh, answering to your question uh, ma'am is that um, i feel luck also plays a very important role uh, what kind of paper comes that particular year 
uh, what uh, my destiny has has also i'm sure played a part in it Swamiji, you were saying something. Yeah. So uh, you said about uh, how it is in general quite stressful when we are studying and we are working hard, etc. Yes. So, uh, and you said that uh, many times you feel, is it really worth it? Yeah. Hmm? So uh, do you intellectually worth it? Or do you think that compromises are uh, really not worth it. No, I feel... Uh, I, I don't ask you personally, but as yeah. for students, I'm asking. So you need to answer on a personal note, but uh, do children uh, uh, occasionally getting the thought understandable, but uh, do children feel that really, I mean, what am I doing? I'm, I'm wasting my time. Or at some point, they do feel that, oh no, it was worth it. Yeah. Uh, I feel that thought comes when they're under a lot of stress and uh, they're put in situations where uh, it makes them wonder uh, and such thoughts come in their head. Hmm. But um, I feel as soon as that situation is uh, averted, uh, they realize that it is definitely worth it because most of the students here, it has been their dream uh, lifelong dream of wanting to be a doctor. So uh, it, I feel in majority of the cases, uh, they must uh, definitely be feeling that it is worth it. Personally, I do feel uh, that all of these hardships, all of the compromises that we make are uh, in turn in future going to make us better doctors and better uh, diagnosticians in general. And not just uh, doctors, better people as well. So I feel it is definitely worth it. But uh, that thought sometimes does come in your head. And I feel for majority of the people, uh, they must be feeling that uh, it is worth it. It's just the situations that they're put in that make them wonder about certain things. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. So Neela ji has a question. Swamiji, shall I ask? Yeah, sure. So do students face uh, difficulties due to totally different syllabus? And if yes, then how do you cope with it? Oh, sorry, I didn't get the question. No, it's kind of uh, uh, relating to your specific study habits, probably. Uh, yeah. So do they have you know any difficulty facing, do they face difficulty to deal with syllabus, uh, suddenly okay. changed syllabus or yeah uh, cbsc state and all that uh yeah uh that definitely happens uh it happened to me as well so i was in ssc board up till 12 uh, up till 10 standard and uh in meet it is uh cbsc board and it was a lot of other the uh, amount of portion that we had uh in 12 standard was way way more than what we had up till 10 standard so people hype up 10 standard as something very big and uh, something that they have to focus on, which they do. But uh, 12 standard, 11, 12 has, is more difficult, definitely more challenging. And uh, after completing 12th standard, uh, when we get into MBBS, we feel that 12th standard was so simple. Uh, this is, that was nothing. This is so much more than that. And every single year that we go ahead, uh, the same thing happens that we feel that last year was much easier. This year is uh, so much more difficult. So uh, coming from SSC board, uh, uh, I had friends in my preparatory class uh, who were coming from ICSC board, and they had already studied some of the things that they were that we were just learning uh, right in their eighth and ninth standard uh, portion. So they had that advantage over us, and. Uh, in MBBS, uh, coping with the syllabus, uh, I feel majority of the students uh, eventually can cope up because uh, I don't want to sound uh, like I'm bragging or anything, but uh, most of the students that come to MBBS are bright uh, from the beginning. So You earned it. It is not bragging. No problem. No, no. Like, yeah, so true. Most of you the students it. that have come here have, are here because they are intelligent. So... Uh, the course makes us feel like we are stupid and we don't know anything. 
but uh, we have to keep reminding ourselves that that is not the case and uh, that's why since they are intelligent that they can cope up with the studies a few of them um, face some challenges but i have seen that some of my classmates who are facing challenges uh, you are in a hostel we all become like a family so i have seen uh, and i have also been a part of this that we have stayed up helping my friend uh, uh, learn a particular concept that she is not able to grasp we have a lot of uh, group discussions and group studies we uh, study on our own and then support each other. each other or something so eventually i feel i think 90 95% of the people are able to cope with it but uh, it puts stress on us that is for sure but uh, coping with it uh, eventually is fine very well put thank you any other question anyone has yeah uh, i'm sheila rajan i have some comments and yeah. uh, i appreciate uh, ashwini's uh, um, uh, points about uh, how to cope up with all this uh, uh, in a very stormy uh, kind of environment and i'm also a physician and now i'm past all these things and now i'm retired as a physician and i work worked most all my life in united states i just want to say some comparison about this first is the age in uh, india we are very uh, young when we get into a medical school we are um, on an average 16 or 17 years and then we go through the curriculum but in united states many of them are older uh, older uh, children and much more um and they know part how the life is and uh, they have some experiences uh, in the life and so they are much older um, uh, uh, population of students and their stress is different than what we have in in india and the secondly the in uh, uh, india we are kind of uh, cone down so if you take science subjects you uh, you can enter uh, only medicine if you take uh, some commerce or uh, um, uh, general uh, for fine arts you know liberal arts you have no idea uh, you cannot even think of going into medical school however in in united states you are very broad based you, you can even uh, take uh, music as your major or uh, uh, any kind of uh, um, liberal arts subjects and then you can co come back to medicine and then you can become a medical student so which is which is a, a different kind of uh, uh, situation is happening here and the third thing is the finance as uh, a children in in uh, in india most of us are funded by our parents we don't have any uh, uh, any uh, great uh, stress about the finance but in united states most of the children are uh, financing their uh, uh, their schools so they have to worry about the finance and uh, uh, they have to work uh, part time jobs in other, uh, just to uh, get the finance to go to school which is a different kind of stress in united states the other thing is uh, um, the stress doesn't stop at this point after graduation is a big stressful situation to think what kind of a um, line uh, speciality line you go through or or, or but we will keep it to ma'am uh, we will keep it to education because yes. this conclave is all about yoga and education so okay. now you know uh, maybe it's time we you know listen to the perspective of how these things can be dealt with some practices uh, using yeah. the theory this the second the uh, other final thing as a student in uh, in india maybe the uh, the um, the age has uh, different now has changed as when we studied maybe 50 years ago 
the the marriage for the girls the marriage was another fa uh, factor you know uh, as factor so as the final students their parents were thinking about the marriage and that was also a stressful event for the for the medical students so these are all the things and then plus the hostile life uh, when you are a student you have to put up with all kinds of uh, people that was another stressful event which we went through so I i'm just saying some of the comparisons of the medical students in india as well as united states thank you thank you thank you so all in all i think we have uh, pretty much uh, uh, everybody uh, you know presented the same point that there is pressure, there is peer pressure, there is emotional uh, stress uh, that comes out because of separation from parents and adjusting with new people, then time management, then what is a bigger purpose? And I'm sure Swamiji has so many uh, answers in his uh, bag and he's going to tell us about all that now. Thank you, Chitraji. It has really been very humbling to listen to the difficulties. It takes us down the memory lane when we also had to face these difficulties. And since we are in the company of doctors, a thought which came to me, I would just like to share that thought. Because we were speaking about stress. I'm sure Dr. Ashwini would have attended obstetric uh, sessions and I, she would have at least observed the birth, the delivery process, right? Now, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but the process of delivery, moving out from the comfort zone of the mother's womb into the world the big bad world, so to say, is a very physiologically challenging event. It is almost impossible. If you look at the structural shapes and the shape of the head, shape of the body, size of the body, and you know the entire birth canal movement and the whole process, I mean, it is really a miracle. At the end of the whole thing, it does feel like a miracle. But if you look at the mechanics of it, it is mind-boggling. Impossible that it can happen. Doctors can understand it a little bit better. And that is not all. Please remember that the entire structure and the physiology of the child was completely different. It was getting nutrition. As uh, Dr. Ashwini mentioned, she was getting nutrition from her family. The khana wana sab cheez aa jata hai. Same way, the baby was having everything on a platter. But when it comes out, it has to breathe for itself. And when it has to breathe for itself, then at that time, in that one to two minutes, there are so many physiological changes which start taking place. The heart, which used to beat, but really did not have much to do because the mother's flow was taking care of it all. The nutrition, everything, the entire physiology has to change completely. And when the physiology has to change, there are so many changes in the heart, in the lungs, in the uh, blood vessels, everywhere. It is... Nothing short of a miracle. It is nothing short of a miracle. And I felt that look, if we, every person over here, every person in the world has passed that test. And if we have passed that test, then we can know for sure. Take it in writing. We can know for sure that there is no challenge in our life which we cannot overcome. 
if we have been able to overcome that challenge, we can certainly overcome any other challenge. So this is a thought which came to my mind. Firstly, and most importantly, we need to bring into our awareness that it is possible. We start with the premise that it is not possible. We need to change that. Dr. Ashwini has mentioned four, five, seven, actually seven important points. First about increasing competition, then about peer pressure, parental pressure, balance between academics and social life, distractions, panic attacks, homesickness and responsibilities, and the purpose of it all. And all of these are very important points. I am afraid I will be only be able to give you some broad guidelines and ideas to be able to go deeper into this subject because this subject is a very vast subject. We will need to have a separate workshop on this. And I believe that the organizers are already thinking of having a workshop that apart. We need to understand that when we were babies, we did not do anything. Everything was happening. I did not work out, oh, I have to take a breath. So if I have to take a breath, that means my lung pressures, my blood pressures, my heart circulation has to change. So I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to do that. No, I didn't have to do anything. It happens on its own. That means that when there is a challenge which comes, please rest assured that the solution of the challenge also is there. All we have to do is we have to look for it. And if we don't look for it, we might not get it. So this is the first thing which we have to remember. Our outlook has to be very clear. And this reflects a lot on the parents. Because today, unfortunately, children are brought up, but there is no upbringing, so to say. There is no thought which is given as to how do we prepare the child for the challenges which are going to come. As a doctor, Dr. Ashwini, tell me that the muscle undergoes stress when you work out. Correct? Hmm? Yes. What is the difference between what is the difference between working out and having good muscles and overexertion and wasting of muscles? Physiologically, not too technically, but uh, conceptually, can you explain? Yeah. So, uh... When our muscles are functioning properly and we work out in the appropriate amount of amount, uh, then the muscle, uh, it increases in size. It uh, undergoes all the metabolism properly that it is supposed to. There is hypertrophy and uh, it doesn't lead to any kind of problems within the muscles. Why? Because uh, the body is not under stress at that point of time. Oh, come on. When you are uh, lifting 5 kgs, it is that, that point of for that muscle, it is a lot of stress. But it is within Swamiji, the physiological you tell... limits uh, that the body can face. Uh -huh. So, you mean to say that there is a graded pressure which is given. Correct? And along with the graded pressure, you also enough nutrition, enough blood supply and all other factors so that there is hypertrophy which takes place. Yes. And if there is, you don't have an opportunity for rest, you don't have an opportunity for uh, rejuvenation and nutrition and all those supporting factors are not there, then the muscle wasting takes place. Right? Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. 
So, uh, you see, this is something which is very important. Stress is a very important activity in life. If there is no stress, there is no life. And therefore, we need to change our attitude. I don't want stress. No. I know, I want to know how to manage stress better. Because if you don't have stress, you will not grow. The muscle hypertrophies, that is, it grows in size only when there is a microscopic cellular injury which takes place at the cellular level. And because there is an injury which takes place, so the for healing, there is more blood supply and all nutrition is poured in and the cell repairs itself. And when it repairs itself, it repairs a stronger cell. And then later, one week later, again, you from 10 kgs, you go to 15 kgs. Again, there's a small injury. Mind you, it is a small microscopic injury. And that microscopic injury then has enough of support. Then that stress leads to hypertrophy. You have good muscles. If not, then there is an injury. And then the muscle starts wasting and ailments start coming in. So, Instead of saying, I want to get rid of stress, you must say that I need to boost myself up so that the stress which is coming, I can harness the stress and give it a proper direction so that I have got better muscles like in this example. This is the first thing. We as humans have an innate capacity to grow. Physically, we might grow till 15, 18 years. Mentally, we keep growing all throughout. We just need to be challenged. But along with challenge, we need to have appropriate support mechanisms. Yoga as a lifestyle speaks of bringing in these support mechanisms for children. And that's why upbringing is very important. Bringing up is one thing. It's a natural phenomena. But upbringing, the samskaras which have to be given and the support which has to be given, that is very essential. Unfortunately, we have lost much of that due to the transitions in the civilizational systems. And it is our responsibility as parents to think over, ponder over, understand and provide. So, the first thing in it here, I would say, goes to parents and to the society. What is the methodology of education? What is the methodology of studying? What are the subjects? All that has to be thought about. However, that is a subject for a different discussion. Today, the students who are undergoing stress, it is not going to help them. So does it mean that yoga cannot help them? No, it can. It can. Remember, yoga has the ability to turn us into superhuman beings. Because each and every one of us is a genius who is a dormant genius. We need to trigger and activate that genius. How can we connect to those latent abilities of ours? That is what yoga teaches us. And there have been multiple research which has happened with yoga. And it has been seen in the morning, I spoke about Swami Niranjananji. He picked up things like this. His ability to pick things up was amazing. Does it mean only he has that ability? No. There are others also. Every person potentially can be that. We don't know how to bring us to that level. Yoga shows us the way. Because yoga improves our 
abilities. So does it mean that everybody has to shave their hair, wear geru and take sannyas? No, it does not. Yoga is not sannyas. Yoga is completely different. And you can include yoga in your study pattern. We need to learn to study smart. How smart? Yogic practices have the ability to increase the ability of the brain, ability of, retain, uh, of reception, of retention, of recall and the lateral thinking. So to be able to improve on that, it has been seen. Firstly, we should not study for more than 40-45 minutes at a time because the brain cannot register stuff more than that. You need to take a break. And here, what we need to do is we need to integrate yogic practices into our studies. There was a research which was done by Swami Yoga Bhakti from France and she has shown that if you have a five minutes, seven minutes yoga practice in the beginning of the class, in the middle of the class and at the end of the class, the ability of the child to grasp, retain, recall and analyze goes up exponentially. We don't have to, you see, for students, the yogic approach has to be totally different. Yes, we can, if you have time, spend half an hour, 45 minutes in the morning. But during the day, that has to be a part of the curriculum. And you can try this out. There are what Swami Niranjan Ananji mentions as small yogic capsules, which you can do. Five minutes in the beginning of the class, five minutes in the middle of the class, five minutes at the end of the class. And then you will see that your ability comes up. Second, there is the practice of Yoga Nidra. And the practice of Yoga Nidra, something which I have spoken of in the morning, is an amazing practice for enhancing your learning abilities. Because Yoga Nidra utilizes the strength of the unconscious mind. When we are studying, we are working with the conscious mind. But through Yoga Nidra, through the, especially the visualization aspect of Yoga Nidra, we can go so deep. Everything what we are studying can just go deep within. And it makes amazing. I know of one doctor who was studying for medicine and he was found it very difficult. But then he discovered Yoga Nidra. He had gone to Swamiji way back in the 70s. And he said that entire day I would study for a couple of hours and just do Yoga Nidra. And study and do Yoga Nidra. And he said that, oh my God, the, my approach, my abilities, everything, I never knew I was capable of all of that. That is very essential. Secondly, we also need to bring about a better understanding of the challenges which we are facing. Like you mentioned of being homesick, you mentioned of uh, the added responsibilities. You see, these are things which are very essential if we want to succeed in life. Succeeding in getting your marks and becoming a gold medalist doctor is one thing. But going out and practicing is a totally different ball game altogether. You might be a gold medalist, but you will not have patients coming to you. And you might be an ordinary uh, student, but patients might line up to you. Why? Because you have got the people skills. You might not have the best of the academic skills, but you have the people skills and patients don't come to you. Or nobody comes to another person because they don't know something. But 
they need another input and when a person feels comfortable then you are able to relate to that person and uplift ourselves so therefore it is very essential to develop skills and in the olden systems of gurukul this was possible now gurukul system no longer works but i would definitely most definitely recommend all children should go and stay in an ashram for 15 days to a month in a year 15 days is also enough because when you go to an ashram you are faced with a challenge but along with that there is this environment which allows you to grow and the this is something which you cannot understand intellectually the moment you are in that environment suddenly many things start coming up that experience is very essential when you have that experience then you will see that the abilities which are there within us start coming up this is very important and that is many times i have heard people say that oh you focus only on studies everything else can come later but no while studies are very essential social interactions are very essential because there you are developing people skills you know how to relate to each other you know how to be empathetic like as dr ashwini said in the hostel they come close together and when we have these networks then that is our strength in times of stress this safety net makes a lot of its impact makes a difference thirdly one thing which as children now not uh, related to medical school but as small children to slightly elder children to slightly elder children and to children who are in their teens till early adulthood and sometimes not even early the whole life this drawback remains it's not a drawback actually but it is a point which we need to understand when a child is born the child in itself has no identity of itself the child thinks that it is the part of the mother and many of us know that when the mother has an emotion the child automatically reflects it i have seen this in the clinics many time the mother comes with a ailment and while explaining the ailment she becomes emotional and she starts weeping and my attention is on the child the while the mother is talking the child is looking here and there enjoying but as she becomes emotional the child becomes quiet it becomes serious and then the child starts weeping the child does not realize that it is a different being than the mother it is the same and that stays for some time it has its good points and its drawbacks both what is the drawback my center of gravity this is a concept in physics if you have any object the center of the gravity of that object has to stay within the object if the center of gravity of that object is outside the object the object will topple so the center of gravity of the child is outside itself it is with the mother and slowly then it realizes oh i am also a individual but this center of gravity still remains outside and that is the reason why we keep looking to other people for appreciation because i am a good boy only when my mother has said good boy to me or my friends have said now first it is the mother then it's my friends and then it's my peers but that remains at some point of time it is very essential that i 
need to bring that center of gravity within myself. When I am able to do that, then what happens? I am able to influence others. Not thus people influence me. This is very essential. Because if we want to progress in life, we need to, at some point, bring that center of gravity within us. When we do that, then the peer pressure can be managed. The parental pressure can be managed. Distractions can be managed. All those things slowly can be managed. But that is a process. And nobody should think that because my center of gravity is outside, it is a bad thing. No, it is a process of evolution which we have to do. Not the physical evolution, but the mental and psychic evolution which has to happen. We have to consciously make it happen. Bit by bit. Does not mean that we go into a pathological level where I don't look at anybody else. No. Of course, I have to interact with others because that gives me an understanding what I am thinking, is it correct or not. But I have my center of gravity. Then what somebody says, I will analyze and do. As Dr. Ashwini pointed out, in a peer pressure, I do a prank. I, I don't want to do a prank or I don't want to smoke a cigarette. But I do it because of peer pressure, because I will be ridiculed. I want to be a bodybuilder. I want to be tall. I want to be whatever that peer group says. Because I want to be a part of it. Why do I want to be a part of it? Because I, my center of gravity is still not within myself. A bit of it has come in. It's not. Eventually, we need to bring that in. Then we are not just joining in because it's a, a need for us to tell that, yes, I do exist. But we are there because we can interact and improve. The level of interaction changes. When this happens, then there is a change. How to do this? No intellectual practices can do that. Only regular yogic practices make it happen bit by bit. And when I speak of yoga, I speak of four things. Yogic practices, yogic diet, yogic lifestyle and yogic mental habits. These four things are essential. And when these four things are brought together, then it becomes an upbringing 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. It is not that we did not have challenges. Our parents did not have challenges. Our grandparents did not have challenges. They had challenges and many of them had even greater challenges. There were people who had to swim across with the books in their hand and go and study and then come back swimming again. And it's not a joke. This is truth. And in some places it happens even today. So challenges are there. But how can I withstand that challenge and you make it into a strength? For that, we need this support system. One, two, three, four. Practices, diets, lifestyle, mental habits. If my parents have not given this to me, it is up to me to be able to step by step start developing it. The very fact that today we are more intelligent. Children today are certainly much more intelligent than their parents. We have a better understanding. We have a better analytical approach. Why has that happened? It has happened because we can pull out these things which have slowly gone to the background and slowly start reinstating it. But if we as children have to reinstate it, then it has to be in the method which is essential for children now, not how it was 100 years ago. 100 years ago, the situation was different. Today, the situation is different. So that is the reason why we need to, we need children to slowly start bringing that energy within. Oh, this is the reason why. That is the reason why we start understanding, we start analyzing and we start experiencing. Then the roads open and something which 
is not spoken generally, but is very essential to be spoken about. As Dr. Ashwini mentioned, when there's a lot of stress, there's a thought which comes, which says, is it really worth it? And then the child says, oh, it's not worth it. Or I'm out of my group. It's not worth it. Life is not worth living. Suicidal tendencies. These are very essential. Because suicidal tendencies come into a person when the stress which is coming on the person, physical, mental, emotional, whichever, is much more than the ability which the child perceives, the child has to face it. We as adults need to provide enough support to the child so that the stress facing ability within the child comes up to face the stress. If it is appropriate, we can reduce the stress. If it, we feel it is excessive or if the child is, it becomes excessive. But please don't ever say, I want to, I hear this many times. I have had so many hardships in my life. I will ensure my child will never have any hardships. If you are a good parent, you will never say that. You are a success story because of your hardships. In addition to your hardships, your parents, your society provided you enough mechanisms but how you could cope with it in a constructive manner. Physically, mentally, emotionally, socially. We as adults need to provide such supports to the children. If there is no challenge, there is no growth. But for challenge, not to harm a child, we need to provide support. And if adults cannot provide support, then we as children need to start learning and take things in our own hands and learn where support can come in. That is where yoga comes in. The discovery of yoga is meant for that. And then we can see there is a change. The genius comes up. Amazing things. The mathematical genius Ramanujan, he did not have an easy life, but he was an amazing genius. Not because somebody taught him, but because of the hardships and his ability to connect to a higher source within. Suddenly, something came and out came the genius. Swami Shivananji mentioned that pain is that crucible into which nature throws human beings when she wants to convert a human being into a sublime superhuman being. So, pain is that crucible in which nature throws man when she wants to convert him into a sublime superman. If I have want to be a superman, then I need to accept pain and I need to be equipped to handle pain and convert it into positive manner. That is where yoga comes in. And I believe this is the only way out. There is no other way out. If we want to have a systematic approach, yoga is the answer. So with this, let us conclude. And if there are any questions, you can take the questions. Thank you, Swamiji. Uh, I mean, first of all, I have uh, one question. Before you started your uh, uh, lecture, uh, we heard Sheila Ji uh, comparing uh, US and uh, Indian uh, challenges, right? So, and uh, when we were talking about yogic practices and, you know, we all know that at the most, these were introduced to the West uh, about 40, 50 years back. But then success stories have been coming from West also in spite of um, all the challenges that they had. I mean, my question in one uh, sentence is uh, what, what uh, I mean, in absence of yoga, how are they able to cope up with all this uh, and get better results than what we produce here? Did gravity exist before Newton discovered gravity? Uh, yes, it existed. Only he gave a name. Uh, 
but we don't see them doing any yoga also right we don't see that, them doing that, that is something that is something which is very important to understand i am very happy you have brought this question out because you see people feel that when i do asana i am doing yoga no asana is one tool pranayam is one tool meditation is one tool yoga is a way of life yoga is not a practice yoga is a way of life and when that way of life has come in then there are certain circuits which get activated within when these circuits get activated within the genius comes up the way of activating those circuits might be so many different so many different ways how many ways are there scripture say neti neti etc 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 is there one way yes is there 10 ways yes is there 100 ways yes is there 1000 ways yes is there 10000 ways yes so how many ways are there all of these and more there are 100 ways to connect to that inner core ability which is there within and once that connection is made then the genius comes forth so uh, formal yogic practices perhaps they don't know but the yogic principles are active in their life because finally the most important principle is chitta ekagrata when the chitta ekagrata takes place then we are able to pierce the barrier and connect and you look at any scientist he had chitta ekagrata i mean you i mean there are examples of uh, Marie Curie. Marie Curie. No, I think it was uh, Paul Dirac, if I remember correctly. He was going somewhere and uh, it started raining and he was thinking of some subject. And he just raised his umbrella and kept walking. He forgot that he had to open the umbrella because his mind was preoccupied in something else. And then he went to his friend's house, sat there. The professor said that uh, the professor was out. So the butler said that please wait here. He will come in some time. He sat there and he started thinking of a problem and he kept on thinking. And he had uh, uh, some snacks were placed in front of him. They were there in front and it was in his hand. But he forgot to put it in his mind because his mind had gone elsewhere. Physically, he was there. Mentally, he was into the problem. Entirety. There were no two things. What is Samadhi? This is Samadhi. I mean, I'm just giving a figurative example, not a literal example. So, people are able to connect to that higher source and then the genius flows through. How? There are hundreds of ways. But if I have not been able to have that by birth, then how to develop it? We don't know. For such people who are not geniuses already, yoga and the yogic system does the way. Got it. Thank you, Swamiji. Uh, Kailaja ji wants to talk. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, sorry, sir. I'm not an uh, My video is not on. No I apologize no for problem. that. Yeah, uh, Swamiji, uh, again, you know, it was an excellent, uh, excellent presentation integrating all the mind, body, uh, now, you know, yoga is not just the asanas, physical asanas, it's the mental attitude. And as a psychologist, I have been practicing uh, in India a few years, six, seven years, but here almost 35, 40 years. And I find myself, I find myself with recently in the private practice, even in the, with the other systems, like my people get better just for the very first session. You know, I don't know myself what is happening here. You know, I'm a psychologist. I, I do use some mental health principles and, you know, relationship, all those things. But still, I think fundamental yogic practices, yogic way of looking and yogic, you know, lifestyle changes and everything you are saying, bringing that inner power within them. So mental health plays a big part. And and I, I, I mean, you're giving me answers. I always tell myself, is it a miracle or am I thinking this way? But I know that 
patients themselves tell me that validate me 90% of the times, but still uh, having that, what is working? What are the mechanisms? There are so many ways we can bring out that inner, inner health and genius or the confidence or, you know, I think yoga practice and yogic way of thinking um, East and West integrating, Eastern and Western way of integrating has been working very well for me so far. I mean, in a service point of view, I don't work for money or nothing like that. But it it is amazing when we integrate those two things uh, can be very powerful. It can be. And it, can I, be. it can be. Yes, certainly. And it is. And please, uh, here we need to remember, I know you are not mentioning it that way, but Generally, not generally, but many times it is said, oh, West means all materialistic, all bad, etc., etc. There's, there's one way of thinking where they think that way. But no, it is not that way. Today, there is this race which is ruling the world. My dining habits, my eating habits, my toilet habits, my sleeping habits, my day, everything is in line with that. This race and this way of this civilization, let us say, is ruling the world. It must have done something correct. It must have done everything wrong. If it had done everything wrong, it would be So it has done something correct. Yeah, it has done few things wrong. True. Everybody does something wrong. We as students of science, especially yogic science, we need to have the ability to discriminate and remove the shaft and pick out the rain. What is it that they are doing which is good, correct and appropriate and useful? Pick it, analyze it, understand it, integrate it with our knowledge and then you will see that it is better. So, uh, what you are doing Shailaja ji is correct. We need to integrate it. We cannot you cannot have it uh, isolated. No, it's not possible. It's not integrated. So what you are doing is very true and correct. And the reason why patients get better in the first session itself is there is an energetic transfer which takes place. Many times you might have observed that when something like this happens, you might feel drained that day. But we might not realize it, but there is some energy which is moving out from us. If I am able to replenish my source of energy, I don't feel drained. But if I have not been able to replenish my source of energy, I will feel drained. Because the patient has taken some from us. And sometimes it's not even taking an energy from us. But our energy creates a field. And when the patient comes into that field, in the same way as an electron comes, into an electromagnetic field, its charge, its spin changes. Its charge doesn't change, its spin changes. It, did, it didn't do anything, it just came into the presence. So it, when that energy is there, patient comes in and there is a shift which takes place. So that is the energetic reason why these things happen. And they do happen. I mean, yeah, yeah, thank you, Swamiji. Definitely, we have to safeguard ourselves, you know, to protecting, not to deplete our energy and be aware of the transfer. But I think intellectually understanding the concepts, what is happening, and cognitively, you know, re redirecting. And there are so many other strategies, mechanisms also work, you know, diagnostically knowing what to be addressed. And so yeah. there is a lot of skill involved, of course, you know, skill and season seasoning, understanding the systems and all those things. So so definitely a lot of codependency happens in most of the practitioners and burnout. The doctors, I, I find like the doctors here and everywhere need some mental health help because they don't have those way of looking. I have that freedom because I'm not relying on medications. So I'm free to incorporate many life principles but they are so stuck in that and they need a lot of help themselves to redirect this and save their energy and all those things. So I think many things, many things involve in this mechanism, the skills and the knowledge and the experience and commitment, all those things, but still 
energy transfer, I find burnout happens if you do not know how to manage ourselves, you know. So that's where yogic practice helps me to be grounded. So that whatever little or more I do is more effective, you know. It helps and it, I'm safe. And thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Swamiji, I have one comment because uh, as a student, it's good to have uh, some of the recreational habits if, too. Before, like, uh, before, before that, uh, Shilaji, I think there were a couple of other queries which have come. Oh, so let us first yeah. take the queries and then we can yeah. uh, discuss on that. Yeah, Swamiji, uh, Vidyaji is asking, we say that yoga is way of life. How should uh, be our typical day ideally? And uh, also, you know, please uh, reiterate the four ways of yogic practices, yogic diet and... Uh, four uh, principles are four principles. yogic practices, yogic diet, yogic lifestyle, and yogic thinking habits. And our day uh, should ideally be in a balanced manner. Depend it, it uh, we cannot have uh, a very uh, chalked out answer because the requirements for every person are different. But in a nutshell, we need to have a balance. We need to provide enough time for rest and recuperation. Because if there is no rest and recuperation, then the wear and tear will be more. There can be uh, less effective ways of re resting and recuperating, there can be more effective and powerful ways of rest and recuperation. That's a different story. But rest and recuperation should be there. Your meals have to be in line with the circadian rhythms and the natural rhythms. Your waking and sleeping habits should be in line with that. When we have these three waking time, sleeping time, meal times, rest times. When these four things are taken care of, then 60% of the problems are taken care of. What for each person, that has to be looked at on case-to-case -case basis. But these principles are important. Yes, yeah, Shilaji, uh, we are running out of time. Uh, please keep it short. You wanted to yes, say something. Yes, I was uh, uh, talking about having uh, uh, like a recuperation of what Swamiji is talking about. It's good to have some kind of a relaxation technique when you are a student, like um, uh, like appreciation of music or music or something like that. So that will uh, it will give a, a kind of balance in your life that when you're really tired of uh, studying or something to way sure. to relax uh, in a healthful way is to have some of these uh, relaxations. I think. Yeah, uh, sure. Thank you, Srilaji. Uh, with that, you know, I actually got remember. I mean, I I remembered uh, one very important thing. Uh, I don't know. I see so many new names today. Uh, so I don't know if you all know that every day morning from six thirty, Swamiji has been doing mantra chanting sessions for a, a year, most more than a year now. Uh, so you know, if if any of you do uh, not if you if any of you are not aware that it happens please contact one of us uh, i will put my number out here in the chat window and also my mail id uh, so that you know you can contact us and we will add you to the group whatsapp group is there and in the morning uh, we have mantra booster yoga nidra also most of the times it happens and there is one yogic practice one breathing practice uh, guided uh, by Swamiji. And we all are uh, benefiting uh, by those practices in the morning. And there is a popular demand that we shift it to six o'clock. Uh, it is strongly supported by me because of my personal needs too. So in uh, next few days, probably we will do that shift also. As of now, it is happening from 6.30 to 7.15. Uh, so India please time. contact us and yeah, India time in the morning. Uh, if anybody is uh, not there in the WhatsApp group, which takes us to the Vandra booster, please contact us. And also, I think those who have not registered for the uh, workshop, uh, for the um, conclave, if they can register, 
then we have their contact details so that we can contact them and the recordings etc also can be sent to those people sure yeah uh, so i'm putting my number here So one quick question. Uh, I want to see how many of you know what is the full form of SSYRF. You can raise your hand or you can put in the chat yeah. window. <laughs> so this is only to uh, you know to see if all of you know what we are doing here. Why this yoga conclave? Because if everybody knows, then it is going to be repetition. But otherwise, uh, I think we should. We should really tell them. So looks like only Sheila Ji knows. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, Sheila Ji, please tell what is SSYRF. Yes, it is uh, Satyam Sumiran um, Yoga Research Foundation. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. So it is uh, Satyam Sumiran Yoga Research Foundation, and there are a host of uh, programs that are happening under guidance of uh, Swami Yoga Pratap uh, and we you know there are seva activities, yoga activities Atma Samvardhan, Pratibha Samvardhan, Gram Samvardhan uh, and uh, every month we have this uh, yoga conclave, Satyam Yoga conclave which uh, uh, caters to one theme of the month and uh, throughout the month during yoga booster Swamiji takes us through yogic practices and uh, yoga nitra and pranayam that is related to that theme of the month and in addition to that every friday i mean the third and uh, first friday we have uh, in conversations with swamiji about uh, satyam uh, swami satyananda ji's principles uh, which will which will actually tell us about yogic perspectives of some very pertinent problem and some fast and festival so this is this has been happening for an year uh, so you you would have missed out if you are new here uh, but uh, still there are a lot many to go in the in the next months so please contact one of us either swamiji or me or karuna is here uh, so if you contact one of us we will be happy to put you in the group and uh, send you all the information about all the programs here, i would like to explain for, like what uh, uh, chitra mentioned why are we doing all of this? What is the aim of this conclave? You see, we have to understand that yoga today is a very popular subject. But what is the scientific, systematic basis of that? What is the scriptural basis of that? That is something we need to understand. And we were very lucky. I personally was very lucky, like millions of us who came in contact with Swamiji and the entire Guru Parampara. But it is essential to share this information. And what better way to do it on the birth centenary of Pujya Swami Satyanandji. He was born in 1923. 2023 is his centenary. So this is the year where we are dedicating ourselves to his teachings. He has taught so many aspects of yoga. How can we understand them? To be able to understand them, what I have devised is from January onwards, every month, I pick up one of his teachings, one of the applications and elaborate about it. Next month, another topic, fourth topic, fifth topic. So one petal opens, another petal opens, another petal opens and slowly and slowly we start understanding what yoga actually means. What is the diversity in yoga? That is the whole idea here. So that is the reason why this Satyam Yoga Conclave is held. And due to popular demand and a uh, lot of pressure from uh, organizers, including Chitra Bhanu and others, there are uh, follow up workshops which we have started now. Because it was felt that uh, we cannot complete everything in one session. So for details, we need to have a workshop. And so we are also having a workshop. And I request the organizers to also share that information. And we are also running a bit late. So we should wrap up soon. 
so the workshop details uh, will be shared later. So, you know, you, you can uh, be in touch with one of us by giving your number and other things, or at least the registration should be enough. Uh, so if you can register, then uh, we will have your details so that we will be able to send you the details. So, uh, Swamiji, shall we conclude here? It's yes. about 9, 10, actually. Okay, thank you so much, Ashwini. Uh, for the you know for the discussion and uh, for all the inputs that you have given and thank you Shila ji, Vidya ji and uh, Tailaja ji and others who have participated actively and thank you Swamiji for giving us all this knowledge and we will look forward to more of it uh, in the next two sessions of this yoga conclave and uh, the following workshop and also the everyday mantra boosters and yoga you know the the coming uh, conclaves. Thank you so much. Namo Narayan. Namo Narayan. Namo Narayan, Namo Narayan Swamiji. We will have Shanti part now. Please sit in any comfortable meditative posture. Sit your hands on your knees in Dhyan or Chin Mudra. Neck, shoulders, and back in a straight line. Keep your mouth gently closed. Become aware of the whole body from the top of your head to your toes. Awareness of your head, neck, shoulders, back, arms, legs, the whole body. Shift your awareness to your eyebrow center, Bhru Madhya. And at the Bhru Madhya, visualize the form of a brightly burning candle flame, the Jyoti Swarupa, the symbol of knowledge that which enlightens and maintaining your connection with this image we shall chant the mantra o three times together followed by the shanti part take a deep breath in o Together, Asatoma Satyamaya Tamasoma Jotir Gamaya Mrityorma Amrutam Gamaya Sarvesham Swasti Bhavatu Sarvesham Shantir Bhavatu Sarvesham Purnam Bhavatu Sarvesham Mangalam Bhavatu Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu Om Triambakam Yajamahe Sugandim Pushti Vardhanam Urvarukam Iva Bandhanam Rityor Mukshiyam Amrutat Om Shanti 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 Hands in Pranamudra Twameva Mata Chapita Twameva Twameva Bandusha Sakha Twameva Twameva Vidya Dravinam Twameva Twameva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva Twameva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva Twameva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva Hari Hi O Hari O Tatsat Gently rub your palms against each other. Place them on the closed eyes. Experience the warmth radiating from your palms to your eyes, to the brain, to the whole body. And then gently move the palms away. Open your eyes. Hari Om. Tatsat. Namo Narayan. Jai Hope.